Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here on the pod with a very special guest, T. Kairas. They are the Games Channel Manager for Haba USA. How are you doing tonight, T? Good, doing good. Doing good. It's a Monday. I almost said earlier that it was it Friday and then got sad. <laughs> it's a Monday. <laughs> hey, you, at least you're closer to the next Friday. You're not having Sunday blues, you know? This is true. This is very true. We're one day closer. All right. <laughs> So how long have you been working for Haba? I um, like yesterday I saw that at, announcement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been working at Haba for um, about two and a half years now, um, like full time. Uh, I had done some consulting work previously um, for Haba for seven years, I think, as like the furthest out we go. But um, from like a full time official contract, like hired, it's it's a little two and a half years. So, yeah. And I guess I want to join the show because I just have so many questions about what it must be like to work for a kids game company. Because I feel like, you know, people joke, oh, games are for kids, but really they aren't, at least within the hobby community. So how has it been to work for a company that directs their product at, at children? Um, interesting and it difficult. It presents a lot of different challenges uh, for marketing, especially that you don't really think of or consider when you think of like the hobby game space, because the hobby game space is like super niche. It's so insanely niche to market to. And um, it's one of those things where a lot of products and brands that we would say are like super successful in the hobby market are like nobody's like literally nobody's outside of the hobby market whereas with kid products or products that are targeted towards children it's almost like the opposite so um a great example is like a successful kid product a a successful family or child game is a game that is like really well done and like super well known and then in the hobby niche market people kind of are like oh yeah you know what I mean? Like they don't really know about it or pay attention to it a lot because a lot of them kids are just a phase of their life, if that makes sense. Uh, so like they'll have kids or they know somebody that has kids, but like when they're hobby spending, they're spending on like games for them. Um, and so they're buying like, you know, kingdom death monster and like all those kind of like big heavy games. They're not totally for kids. Like, oh, what's the next toddler game coming out? Like nobody, you know what I mean? And even if you have a toddler, and you buy our toddler games and you love our toddler games, your toddler grows up. And so like, you don't super care necessarily what our new toddler game is in two years, unless you had another toddler. So it's kind of like this really interesting thing where um, it's a different audience, but it's the same audience. But then also it's an audience that has a timeline. Like, like you can sell, um, we'll say root, right? If somebody likes Root and plays Root, you can sell Root to them forever because like they're never going to outgrow Root, but they're going to outgrow, they're going to outgrow like Nibble Munch Crunch, like (laughs) pretty quickly. So (laughs) yeah. So that actually leads me to another interesting question though, which is, all right. So I mean, we all grow continuously as people. I'm not saying that we are now static, right? But What's funny is that, you know, you grow out of children's games at the same time, those may be some of the most important games you ever play because you're learning like a sponge at the time that you're exposed to them. So what kind of consideration goes into making sure that a children's game, I mean, do you consider, is it, is it about entertainment or is there like an educational growth component as well going into Hava product? Uh, Both, definitely both. And we, weigh both of those considerations the same. So um, every game that Haba makes, we actually, well, we, I, I say the proverbial we, I don't do this. Um, there's a team, our games developer team, and they actually sit down with children psychologists. Um, we have some children psychologists on staff. We have somebody who has a doctorate in ch- young children's education and, and brain development. And they sit down and they look at European, because it's based in Europe, Um, German and European uh, education standards for benchmarks and um, that kind of stuff and cognitive development. And they make sure that our products line up with a certain number of those development skills. And then also at the same time, 
they make sure that the product is fun um, because nobody's going to want to play the world's best game that teaches, I don't know, how to hold a pencil if it's a very boring game where you literally just hold a pencil. <laughs> so um, it's one of those things where we um, kids learn through play. It's how they like just naturally learn through play. That's how our brains work. That's how it's worked for millennia. And so we want to design products that will teach during play. Um, and so we said for one for a while there, our slogan was um, through the power of play. Um, so yeah, that's, we super, it's, yeah, there's like this huge document. I actually had to reference it today. Um, what do we call it? It's a giant acronym and it's the HLP game matrix. Uh, and we look at it, um, for all of our games, the child psychiatrist like fills them out and stuff. So we can always, um, different countries can map them to different education standards and stuff like that. So it's the serious business that I don't think about. Uh, at all. Uh, luckily, I just get handed the information. So that's the nice part. <laughs> that is really interesting. Yeah. So I've always heard it. I don't know if this is even true. I think I just read it on Twitter somewhere. But I've heard that one of the reasons that ages for play tests on a lot of games don't go very low mm -hmm. isn't actually that younger kids can't play the game. It's that mm -hmm. there is a cost to play testing with younger groups of kids. Is that true? And how does that affect this specific yeah. line of work? So it's true and it's not true. So, so um, a lot of niche hobby board game companies don't pay for children's testing. Uh, and so when you're importing, the U.S. has the highest standard of testing requirements. It's not play testing. It's, it's specifically product testing. Um, and it's specifically looking at the uh, materials and components used to create that product and then making sure that those products pass certain safety regulations that the U.S. government imposes. And the U.S. government's safety protocol is the most stringent in the world. If you have a certificate that says that your product passes the U.S. safety standards, you can basically sell that product anywhere in the world. And um, Amazon in particular has really started, because um, for a while there, it was a wild, wild west. People could sell anything on Amazon. Amazon got in trouble. And so now they are really being strict and not allowing third-party sellers to sell products on their website that say it's for a specific age if you don't have the correct testing documentation for that age. And when I say have the correct testing documentation, you can make a product that is like literally a piece of paper and if you have it in a box and you say it's a game and you say that that game is for eight and up you have to have paid for u.s testing to verify that that piece of paper passes the testing so it's almost like it doesn't actually matter what's in the product you just have to have the testing if you're marketing it towards that age group and it's classified as a game because games are inherently classified as toys so there's that and it is expensive it's not un, it's not unrealistically expensive but it's expensive and it's something that a lot of hobby niche people don't really care or think about when they're like doing their budgeting and so for them it's a lot easier to just be like say 14 and up on the box because if you say 14 and up on the box you no longer have to worry about the child safety testing so and if you go younger um i believe it's 14, you don't have to have anything. It's either eight or 10. There's a second level of testing. And then the most stringent testing that you have to have is for anything marketed to under three years or, or three or younger, you have to do choke tube testing where they have a model of a human face with a throat and they drop your products down it to see if it gets stuck in the model. It's weird. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you fail, they send you graphics of your, they send you pictures of your products stuck in this like fake human mouth. It's really trippy. Um, <laughs> but, but come on, who hasn't tried to eat Azul pieces as an adult? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. So um, yeah. So depending on how young you get, your product testing has to get more, it will get more and more expensive. The most expensive of course is, is like if you're doing anything for under three, um, so yeah, so that's what it is. And that's why a lot of game companies will just say, nah, we're just going to say 14 and up. 
or 10 and up, right? Depending on where they're targeting. And that's why there's actually an issue that we have in, in the, the, the niche hobby industry, especially. Um, but it's, it's growing to be a problem outside of our niche little hobby where parents will see a game and they'll say, Oh, that game says 14 and up. Well, my, uh, my kid can play this game. That's this 14 and up. So I can just get this and play this with my kids and my kids like eight and it's fine. Well, so then they have this like skew in their head where, where games are aged older than they like actually are. So then you have this problem where if you actually set the age for the game to match cognitive brain development and also like different skill stuff, they see it and they say, oh, that game says it's for eight year olds. That means my five year old could play it. It's too young for my eight year old. It's too young. It'll be too basic. So like there's this weird stigma where people will think like, oh, if it's aged for 10 or if it's aged for eight, it's going to be too boring for adults. I don't want it. It's going to be too simple. It's like, no, but just no, not necessarily. <laughs> like, yeah. I actually wonder about that too, because, okay, I play a lot of heavy games. I will absolutely spend hours playing a game with a billion pieces that are certainly not child safe. But at the same time, you know, we talk about elegance in game design a lot. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of people who design games who wish that they could make something that's beautiful in its simplicity. Um, what do you take from your experience with children's games into your life as an adult hobby gamer? Has it impacted your opinions about what makes a game good? It has absolutely impacted what makes a game good. Oh my goodness, yes. I used to play super involved heavy games where I would have to sit down and read the rule book. And it would be like, I would read the rule book for like 45 minutes, an hour. I would like have to like internalize it and make sense. And then I would set it up and then I would teach whoever we were playing with. And then I'd be like, okay, we're going to go. And I would re-reference that rule book. And it would be like, I was like prepping for a college exam or something. Right. And now, now, cause I play all these other games that are hobby games and I play, I play a lot of um, games in the family light strategy kids game area just for like business competition awareness right so um now we sit down to play these big involved games and i'll just be like but why do i have to even do that like you're just adding a layer of abstraction away from the fun just to add busy work like it's not why mm, <laughs> like and my husband's just sitting there going not every game is going to be a hobby game. <laughs> I'm just like, well, I get that. It's fine. But like, why do I have to do this to do this to do this? When obviously if we just did this, it would be faster. It would be more fun. And there's no reason for this busy work. Like if I wanted to do busy work, I'd go answer my emails. Like, why are we doing this? So yes, it absolutely has impacted it. The other day I pulled out a rule book and I looked at it. And I was just like, nope, I'm just not even, I'm just not, I'm just not gonna like, and so we went to see if there was a video teaching us how to play and there was a video and they started into it and they started doing this setup and I was like, nope, nope, we're done. I'm just, I don't even care anymore. And then we just got rid of the game. <laughs> I was like, it was Lisboa. And I was like, I played this three years ago and loved it. There's like a stream of me playing this game and I had like taught it and I was like, this is great. It's super simple. And I could not remember how to play it. And we were trying to remember it. And I was just like, nah, it's too complicated. I don't really feel this. No, let's just play. Let's just play Calico. That's yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So when you are either, you know, playing maybe a Hava game or, you know, testing out, you said you play a lot of family weight games to like be aware of what's out there. Are you playing with other adults? Or are you playing with kids or a mixture? Uh, a mix. I mostly am playing with other adults because that's the fun group, the, especially right now, right? Um, our COVID friendly bubble is all adults. There's no kids in the bubble because as soon as you start adding families, it gets really hard to keep um, a bubble tight because kids have to go to a lot of places and all that kind of stuff. So um, I do a lot of playing with adults. Um, and then when I do have the chance, the family that's like the only family 
I will quarantine for is my family, my nieces and my nephews. And so if we have a chance, we do sit down and play. So like this weekend, I had a chance um, to play with one of my, um, we call her, we call her a nibbling, which is a gender neutral niece right now. Um, but we were playing and I got to play two games with them and it was super fantastic. We did, um, Dragon Parks from the French company, Arcana. I don't remember. Uh, Luna Imports is importing it into the US, but, um, it's Dragon Parks and, and then we also played King Domino and I was just like, oh yeah. The point of this game isn't actually what we're doing in the game when we play it with you. The point of this game when we play it with you, young seven-year-old, is that I'm tricking you into doing math. <laughs> oh, yeah. Educational oh, games are so hard to make, too, because honestly, most kids absolutely see through your game, To You know, they they know. They totally know. Yeah. So she did not. Going... Did <laughs> so if you're going to play a Hava game with in a group of entirely adults, mm-hmm. which one would you choose? I mean, right now, right yeah. now I play Valley of the Vikings with adults because I'm trying to get good at trick shots. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother. So in Valley of the Vikings, you have a, there's a ball and you're, you're hitting the ball with the batter, like a, like a paddle and you're trying to knock down these barrels, but you can arrange the barrels for yourself or your opponents, depending, uh, in the orientation that you want, but you're always bowling from the same spot on the board for yourself. And so there's some really interesting strategy in like how you put the barrel so that they're good for your orientation, but bad for your opponents. And then like, you're trying to sometimes maybe force your opponent to hit a specific type of barrel. And like, it's really interesting. And then you can get like trick shots with I've seen videos I haven't managed to do some of these trick shots but like I have faith in myself eventually I will get there um so yeah so that's what I'm currently playing plus it's always a lot of fun and lots of yelling at each other um and then I also just I absolutely always always am down to play animal upon animal as a classic nice all right so back to a more serious question (laughs) um (laughs) so how does uh, creating products that are essentially into kids affect marketing? Does that change where you're able to advertise the kinds of advertisements you're allowed to put out? Like, are there are there restrictions on marketing to kids that I just wouldn't know about as somebody who doesn't ever think about it? Yes, absolutely. So there's a couple of different ways to approach the question. Um, so you can market to the kids themselves or you can market to the um, family members of the kids or the kids who are going to, the people who are going to buy the product for the kids. So, so sometimes we'll, we will do marketing campaigns specifically targeting parents, but more often for our products, because we're a higher end product, um, right? Like, I mean that in comparison to like Hasbro or, you know what I mean? Like the games that you would find at well, like, what is it? Uh, you can get, there's some kid like, out oh, no, I'm blanking entirely, but like Yeti and my spaghetti, right? Like that you can get for like 12 bucks at Target or something. Like when you look at Animal Pine Animal, which is $24.99, that's, it's really hard to compare those two from a price standpoint, right? So um, we're often targeting not the parents or the kids specifically, we're targeting like grandparents, aunts and uncles, Um, parents of the niche hobby parents we love to target because niche hobby gamer parents who bought these games and played these games with their kids are more inclined to purchase these games um, for birthday gifts or Christmas gifts um, for either like friends of their kids or like their own, you know, nibblings, whatever. So um, when you're marketing to that audience, it's kind of standard marketing like you would with adults. If you're specifically targeting kids, the Federal Trade Commission has a lot of rules and regulations around that. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that you can and can't say, both in advertising um, to adults or to kids, but in kids specifically, you can't be, they're like extra, extra on it in regards to um, being accurate because kids can't, um, I mean, some adults can't do this. Kids can't perceive the difference between like 
actual and marketing strategy, right? So if we were to make, we'll do this as an example. If we were to make a Rhino Hero commercial for Rhino Hero, and in the commercial, we were using a giant version of Rhino Hero, right? And in the commercial, we said at some point, this is just, if like, if we basically like made it look like in the video, the game got hit with a, a growing ray and the game grew and then they were playing Rhino Hero with the giant version. Adults would be able to figure out, oh, if I buy this, I'm not buying a giant version, I'm buying a normal version. And the, the joke is it got big, right? Well, a kid can't connect that dot necessarily. And so we could potentially get flagged and fined because we're misrepresenting our product because we're specifically targeting it to kids. But if we were targeting it to adults and it was obvious, you know, like, oh, they got hit with a growing ray, like we would not have that problem of misrepresentation. So that's where it gets kind of sticky. And then YouTube, if you're doing any kind of advertising on YouTube, YouTube has even stricter rules around kid content um, in regards to like allowing comments or feedback, because what will happen is, is you'll make a video and the intention is for it to come up on like YouTube kids or for kids to get served the video. And then they scroll down and they see all those famous YouTube comments, right? And so you don't want that to be happening. So that's some considerations. It gets it gets a lot broader, but yeah, <laughs> it's something we have to think about. But like I said, we mostly don't market to kids, actually. We are mostly marketing to the people with the money. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so basically y'all are going to be in the gift catalog and grandma's looking for a, a beautiful birthday gift to send. And she's like, Oh, this is such a nice game. And I can just imagine my child having these beautiful memories, stacking animals and off you we go. Do, so you say you laugh, but animal upon animal is actually in a few gift catalogs. Um, and we're actually going to be the Christmas edition last year was in a um, gift catalog for some airline like the airline because you know there's 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 it's the sky mall right like yeah. <laughs> it was like the that it wasn't shopping. actually sky mall but yes <laughs> like people still shop that way um and animal upon animal was featured uh, as one of the options so yes absolutely that's fantastic. You know, I actually never thought about the YouTube thing. I remember YouTube making all those changes about, you know, our kids in this video. Is this for children? Uh, how mm -hmm. does that impact? Also, I mean, does, does Haba do things like create media that's meant to be like a how-to video or things that are meant to be viewed by families that would affect revenue, advertising? How, how has that changed? Well, so... It's a great question. And, and this is something that Watch It Played and I had a long, Rodney from Watch It Played and I had a long discussion um, when YouTube changed the laws and or their regulations in 2019 uh, and 2020. And basically, from a revenue advertising standpoint, it doesn't change anything. But from a making the product standpoint, um, like and when I say product, I mean like the how to play video, it, it changes some stuff. So for example, we're just going to use Watch It Play because Rodney is amazing and I'm sure he won't mind. Um, so, for example, if I have Rodney make a how to play video for how to play Honga, which I actually he did a how to play video for Honga. Um, there was this huge question of is that how to play video targeted for children or is that how to play video targeted for the parents and the children might be watching? Right. Because there's a difference there. There's absolutely yeah. a difference. And if the answer is the video is targeted towards the parents and children might be watching, you don't have to do anything different. But to play it safe, you can disable comments on your YouTube channel so you don't have to run into any situations where like a kid's watching it for some reason and scrolls down. Um, if you make a YouTube video and you specify that the video is made for children, um, YouTube by default will disable comments and a couple of their like ad revenue stuff. Um, and so that's like how that changes. But it's a question of like, what is the intention of the product? So another great example is there's a YouTube channel called Kids Splaining. And um, they without they, they launched their YouTube channel by teaching Rhino Hero. Um, 
we didn't know they nobody knew they existed they loved rhino hero and they wanted to do this and they're two brothers and they're super slick they're super smart and they wanted to make they wanted to make a video on how to play rhino hero and so they did a how to play rhino hero video and technically they are kids in the video teaching how to play the game but is the video target towards other kids right and then the 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 question of if there's kids in the video or not is just are the kids being treated correctly because there was a while where where there were kids in the video and then you got into child actor laws and like a whole thing so that's what that part is but um yeah it's just a consideration of like what's the intention from hobbit standpoint we do have and we do make professional marketing videos that do have paid children actors in them and that's a whole other conversation because those marketing ads might go anywhere. They go on YouTube, they go on TV in Germany. We don't pay for TV spots here in the US um, because it just doesn't make sense. But in Germany, where Haba is as well known as Hasbro, it 100% makes sense. So those videos are made um, under European children actor laws and all that kind of jazz. So. Right. Huh. So I, I also know that you are fairly active on the convention circuit. So you go to a lot of cons. What? I don't feel like I see very many kids at gaming conventions, but I could be really wrong. What is the, what is the utility of going to the convention circuit for Haba? So it depends on the convention. Um, but the conventions that we go to, there's always a family presence. Always. We don't go if there's no family presence. And there's actually some conventions like BDG um, fall, which does not allow kids at all. So, um, there are a lot of people that, especially in the summer, when conventions normally are in a not COVID year, um, there are a lot of families that actually will go to conventions as their like family vacation. And so um, there's a lot of utility as a family company to be there. We have families that roll up to our booth and will spend three, four hours just playing every game they can on our demo table. And they'll come back every day and um or we'll have like instead of the whole family rolling in we'll have like one parent with one kiddo while the other parents out you know doing whatever um right and then we have found at gen con especially we're not doing any gen con events this year just because we didn't it's a weird year for us it's, it's a weird year for everybody but it's a weird year for us where normally at gen con and origins we absolutely try to make events that are um family friendly and kid friendly and specifically targeted towards families and kids because we have been told several every time we run these events every freaking time we sell out and then we are always told by at least one parent that they are so happy we run these events because so few events are like kid friendly and i mean kid like five or six year old right um and so for us there's not as many families as not family, like non-families, right? <laughs> right, for sure, at these conventions. But the families that are there, it's their family vacation, and there's definitely enough of them to make it worth it for us to kind of cater to them. But we also have parents that come, and like, this is the parent's solo vacation. Like, maybe it's dad, maybe it's mom, maybe it's dad and mom, and kids are with the grandparents at home, like, whatever. They will come by the Haba booth specifically to buy presents for their kids. So that's the other side of the coin. Like, We've definitely have, I have a couple of reoccurring parents who work for their publishers that always come by my booth and will just walk up and say, hey, what's new this year? I promised so-and-so a present. And I'll just be like, yep, this, this is what you want. And they won't even ask about the game. They'll just be like, perfect. Here's the card. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So there's like a whole there's a whole market of parents buying gifts for kids that they left at home. And then there's the whole like families that roll in and like, we're part of their, this is their Disneyland. Like this is their Disney world is to come to Gen Con or origins and be able to go to booths and like play and hang out and be treated like they're special. Cause they are. I'm now angry at my parents. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I went to, how old was I? I wasn't, I was a teenager. I was like, I went to a game convention for the first time when I was 14. And I was like, this is. The <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. 
All right, so I have one more question. I'm thinking back to like my own childhood, right? And the kinds of toys I like to play with. And so I was a Game Boy Nerf and like dinosaur and bug kid, if that makes sense. That's and um, you, you I lost remember me a bug, but I was right there with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember my grandma tried to give me a cabbage patch kid, and my mom made me act happy to receive it, and that was my lesson in being grateful for gifts you don't want. <laughs> And I guess it made me wonder, um, you know, children's toys are some of the most sort of gendered products mm-hmm. that we have. What is Hava's current position on that? Um, our toys and products are genderless. So, um, well, I say that we do have some dolls that we specifically gender, but that's a whole other thing. Um, in regards to play, um, yeah. we don't gender our games. Um there's some arguments about whether or not we do have a product that comes in a pink box and it's because that product is called unicorn glitter luck, which is an IP. Um, it's an intellectual property out of Germany called Einhorn Glitter Luck. Um, and, um, per contract, their boxes have to be pink because it's part of the IP, but that's like, we're not doing it to target girls in the U S that's kind of how it ends up coming off, which is a real bummer. Um, but that's, that's the only, that's the only product that people can make an argument about gender. Otherwise, that's why we have the yellow boxes, um, Mm -hmm. is like yellow is not, yellow is gender neutral in regards to marketing purposes. Um, it's just generally accepted as a gender neutral color. Uh, and so that's why we make our games that color. And then when we put out a game with dragons or unicorns or anything like that, with the exception of unicorn glitter luck, which is an IP, we try really hard to not have any art that is specifically like overly, Oh, all of the humanoid characters are female, right? That kind of thing. Um, So we always try to do a nice balance and then have some androgynous character art, that kind of thing Um, in our rule book editing. We um, make sure example players are a mix of gendered names. And then also we do include some non-gendered or non-binary characters in the example arts. And then when we refer to you or any that kind of thing, we we just use singular they, them for pronouns instead of she, he, that kind of thing. So, yeah, Um, that is, that's kind of the thing. And it's really actually funny because the rulebook thing was not the standard before I was hired. That was a thing I implemented and enforced. Um, but the art thing and the marketing is actually standard at Germany in Germany at headquarters. Um, and the reason the language thing was not standardized in our rulebook for they them is because German is a um, it's a gendered language. It's a gendered language, and there are three genders in German, but there is not a. Um, there's not a neuter, um, a neutral um, pronoun that is used for people um, yeah. or professions or anything like that. And so it's really interesting because you can have gender neutral objects and like things like that. And um, while the word for like dog is gendered to be um, male and the word for cat is gendered to be female, it's accepted that you can have um itsy katsun that is like a boy cat so you can have a you can be talking using the female pronouns talking about the cat um for a male cat uh so like they're totally cool with the idea but then when they went to do like the translation into english they were like no but in english professional english you have my, my, that russian that was a russian accent um, but when you go to translate into english like the professional uh transition firm that they were using was like no there's just he and she like that's all there is right but now it's becoming no, more normal and like the world health organization is or and like a bunch of different dictionaries the um Webster Dictionary, all that kind of stuff was like confirmed it works. And so now the official translation firm is like, yes, okay, this is acceptable. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I'm actually really looking forward to watching modern languages adjust to a broader range of identities over time. Um, as a, I mean, I've studied Latin. We are actually trying to work out what pronouns to use for our non binary students uh, in Latin. 
And that's Ooh. actually still a live thing, even though people don't speak it anymore. You speak it in your classroom. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a good point. It's, well, and actually it's really it's really interesting because like with English in specific, singular they them was a thing. It was a thing for years. And if it, it was in a thing it was a thing in like the seventeenth century English and then language evolved and it kind of like fell out um but it's coming back which is really funny so when people are like this doesn't exist this isn't a thing it's really convenient to be like well here's here's a history paper about how it is a thing so yeah <laughs> but also um, i mean languages evolve yeeting wasn't a thing a couple years ago either so. <laughs> that's like my favorite i was i was telling my my husband i was telling him that yeet is my favorite thing and i was like because i said it and i was like does it mean I'm old? Like the kids have come up with a term and I lo- I feel like this is like yo dog. Like this is yeet is my generation's yo dog. Like we get to mess up this word and I am very <laughs> excited about it. And I now understand why when I was a teenager, all these adults were messing up our terms because it's so much fun. <laughs> Oh yeah, I really enjoy the. How do you do, fellow kids? And they get so oh, yeah, mad yeah. when you. <laughs> when oh you my use gosh. Their vernacular. <laughs> yes, I now understand. <laughs> Having now being an older person, I now fully understand the joy that comes with using a younger generation slang incorrectly. It's the oh, best. Yeah. It, it really <laughs> does bring joy. You. <laughs> Uh, so I have one more question about the the marketing of gender neutral products. So this is, I think, yeah. United States specific, which is if you put something in a yellow box, okay, we can agree between us that that is gender neutral. But mm-hmm. does that have a tendency to default to boy in the United States? Because I feel like things that are neutral, like even a unisex shirt, that what that really means is like a guy's shirt that a woman is being encouraged to buy. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And we struggle with that a lot. We do actually, that is something that we've really tried to overcome in marketing. Um, and the best we can do is just try and have more, it's kind of, it's really frustrating. So like, I'll see this at consumer shows that I go to, or when I do retail store visits where a parent will come in and they'll look at the shelf and they'll be like, "Mm, this looks great. Do you have any girl games? And I'll just be like, this whole rack like there's like there's literally nothing in here that's a boy game so by definition (laughs) like um but it's it's really frustrating and so it's one of those things that we're trying to figure out how to move against and a lot of that is just cultural um right like there's boys dinosaurs and race cars are for boys nope but like until that mentality gets yeeted into the sun we can't i can't do a ton Um, I actually ended up in an argument because we came out with an animal upon animal unicorns and then an animal upon animal dinosaurs. And somebody got mad at us because we made gendered games. And I was like, no, we made a game that was for fans of unicorns and we made a game for fans of dinosaurs and we released them at the same time as a promotional thing. We weren't making a girl game and we weren't making a boy game. Like... We were making a dinosaur game and a unicorn game, right? Like, and it was, it was frustrating because like, and they were like, well, you used colors that were more for girls in this game and colors that were more for boys in this game. And I was like, no, I mean, yes, the unicorn game is more pastels, but there's blue and green. And like, I mean, if you're going to talk about gendered colors and then the dinosaur game, there's actually more female colored if you're gonna with colors but they're primary and they're bold and so the like the color style was more masculine and I was it was was just super frustrating because like we can't do a lot to overcome that um we're trying so for example we have a new version of Monza and the cover has like we made sure they're they're kids in race cards wearing helmets like how do you gender a kid in a race car while they're wearing a helmet and the answer is you can't unless you try really hard and so we had some we had an artist draw like a little girl standing on the side and like she's holding her helmet to make it very obvious that it's a girl like it's just like uh. um so yeah and then like we have a dragon that we have 
we have a dragon game and we made sure that the dragon has like very pronounced eyelashes with like eyeliner <laughs> it's just like uh... yeah which i always find that really hilarious because like i as an actual woman do not bother with that business like yeah yeah it's it's definitely a generation thing and it's a cultural thing more more people and in the united states there's definite areas in the united states where it's more of a thing than not and so we try to to we try to follow the norm but not so it's it's just it's really hard um and there's no great answer um aside from putting a sign on everything that says all all these games are not gendered <laughs> like you know like um there's not a lot we can do which really bumps me out we can try with the art and you can try to make it more kid friendly but like but like i said you know you go into a game store and people just inherently think the games are for boys right and not for girls and it's just like no 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 like like there was uh, i read the most sexist post on bgg the other day about how wingspan was for women like wingspan was specifically designed for women and marketed to women and that's why yeah and i'm just like no it was i mean it was marketed not towards a masculine audience but it was just marketed towards a more mainline audience but like <sighs> So before we kind of, I know that I know your time is tight tonight, but I guess I would ask then, do you see sort of positive change over the time that you've been working for Haba? I mean, as a teacher, I feel like I'm seeing change every day. I, I'm very optimistic about a future where more people get to live the way they want to and as the, the people they are. But I don't know if it's showing up on your end yet. Um, yes and no. I mean, it kind of depends on what we're looking at, right? Like, there's a lot of change happening right now, especially in the United States, um, when it comes to, if we're going to talk about, like, gender, right? Um, like, there's a lot of change that's just happening. Um, and there's a lot of conversations that are happening right now, specifically around, like, trans and um, non-binary and pronouns and things like that. And that conversation was happening before, but it, like has become primary stage conversation recently. And we have seen a change. Um, and it's really interesting because we have seen stores, larger stores, um, that previously used to have gendered sections come back and say, oh, we don't have gendered sections anymore because that's not a thing. So we have this and we have this and like we try to keep in mind what parents of little boys tend to buy. But like we try not to gender. Do you have any products? And we're just like, yeah, the same products we've always had. <laughs> so <laughs> luckily, internally, we really haven't had to change anything. We do. Like I said, we have gotten pushback, especially about um, Unicorn Glitterlock, the pink box, which we just we can't change because um, it's, it's like my little pony. Like that's the kind of branding IP it is. Right. Um, so there's that, um, but we do still have occasional pushback from consumers, like trying to be like, you're doing this thing. And it's like, no, this, uh. um, so it is getting better, um, from the conversations that we've had, um, in the last couple of years in regards to like retail stores that we're working with, um, from a parent standpoint, I don't think it's gotten better because I don't think we were having that problem so much. I will say, I think that, um, we're having a lot more conversations with moms than we used to in the past. I've noticed that I've noticed, um, a lot of our, a lot of the interactions that we have, um, with customers tend to be more with moms than dads on the games recently whereas before it was more dads being like oh i bought this game and i and i want to believe that's because more moms are going into game stores right um because yeah. our products are mostly in game stores i want it to, i want to believe that more moms are buying games for like the whole family and for themselves 
Um, so they're going in those spaces, whereas before it was dads going into game stores and then buying something for their kids. So that's what I want. I want to I want to say that's why we're getting more <laughs> comments and stuff from moms, but I don't I don't think I don't I have no evidence to that. That's just kind of what I want to believe. I want to hope for. <laughs> so. You know what? I want to believe with you. So into the <laughs> softball questions. What's your favorite game right now for yourself? What are you playing? That is not a softball. That is the worst question ever. I hate it. Um, <laughs> just something think, you like right now. Snapchat. Right now. I mean, the game that I always say is Calico right now. I like, I am down to play Calico anytime unless I'm asleep, but I even might wake up to play Calico. Um, I just, it's so simple and it's so frustrating because it's so simple. Um, there's some really interesting decisions and you can be really mean to your opponents, um, or you can be nice. So, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And where can we find you online? Yeah. So, um, Twitter is the best place. Uh, I'm the one tar on Twitter. Um, and I, that's really the only place I interact online. Um, I don't do Facebook much anymore. So. Yeah, or Instagram, but fair enough. And everyone out there, you probably know this already, but you can find me anywhere as Beyond Solitaire. T, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was been it's been great to talk to you, and I feel like I learned a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, everybody. Leave a comment, like, subscribe, all that business, and happy gaming.